I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the shock when she discussion on the ethical we left more of a community for China to back over doing in autism the election of Barack Obama and his family's move to the White House has sparked the nation's curiosity about the Obama family's early experiences as middle-class African Americans. We recently had a chance to talk with Mary Patillo, who has been called this generation's leading sociologist on race and class in the 21st century. A professor of sociology and African-American studies at Northwestern University, Patillo is the author of Black Picket Fences, which takes a candid look at the rarely studied black middle class. It's been said that Patillo's most recent work, Black on the Block, will be the definitive book on urban Chicago for generations to come. Thank you very much for having me. You are considered a rising star in American academia. At, uh, at 30, you became a tenured uh, professor. You're an award-winning author. And your research on the black middle class has won accolades and financial support from foundations and from organizations. How did you become interested in studying the black middle class? Um, I think a lot of social scientists are driven by personal experiences and personal concerns. So I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my family is a black middle class family, but we lived in a neighborhood that was probably lower middle class, maybe working class. And then I went to college and I was an urban studies major and I went to New York and two things happened. First, uh, much of the sociological literature on black communities was focused on the black poor. And I felt that this was really one-sided and didn't really show the diversity of the black community. And so um, I was moved to want to study middle-class African-Americans knowing that both my own experience seemed to be absent and the experience of many other people I knew seemed to be absent. Um, but secondly, what also was interesting was I met a number of, a number of my peers at Columbia um, had come from black, predominantly black suburbs. Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in the country and it's also a city where, at least when I was growing up in the 70s, um, the majority of the black population lived within the city and didn't live in the suburbs. So actually black suburbanites were curious to me. What so did you make of that? I knew that there, of course I knew there were suburbs, but in Milwaukee, not only did I go to school in the suburbs, but I went to school in a suburb called Whitefish Bay, where the joke was called White Folks Bay. Um, so the racial dynamics in Milwaukee were so crystal clear that blacks lived in the city, whites lived in the suburb, and that was that. So when I went to New York and learned that there were both black people living in suburbs and majority black suburbs, I really thought I'm very interested in these metropolitan processes of people sorting across parts of the city. And you were encouraged when you were at Columbia University not only to become a social sociologists and to study this, you, you've said that the black middle class is, is too often ignored, not just by uh, scholars, mm -hmm. but also by the media. And so I just did a quick <laughs> uh, search on Wikipedia and what came up were pages and pages on American middle class, a half a page devoted to the black middle class. Hmm. It's disappointing given that I was feeling like we were making such progress. When I say we, I mean we sociologists who started to study both the black middle class, the Latino middle class, there are books now on the Asian middle class. And I think it's for Asian Americans, there's been more of um, research on non-poor Asian Americans. But for blacks and Latinos, it's by and large been on poor neighborhoods, on poor families, on poverty in general. So it's a little disappointing that you know there's still just a half a page. But nonetheless, a half a page is better than I'm sure I would have found had either there been Google and Wikipedia when I was in college or had I done that when I was in college. Um, so I think we as social scientists, we as um, people in the media still have a ways to go to balance out and understand again the diversity, the, 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 the fact that the black community is not monolithic. Um, I also, also think it's important as you might have when you might have been, what you might have been reading, thinking about the American middle class, to think about the diversity within the American middle class and to think about ways in which the term middle class doesn't mean the same thing. I was going to ask you, how groups. do you define yeah. middle class? So, you know, there are objective ways to define middle class. So we can think of middle class as really m the middle of the income distribution. Uh, we can think about it as um, white collar. Uh, employment, so people who are in the professions or in technical jobs or in office jobs, those kinds of things. Those are some of the more 
the ways that social scientists try to objectively measure middle class. I think in our everyday lives, we define middle class much more subjectively. We find out if people are homeowners or not. We find out if people have gone to college or not. We also use other terms like upper middle class, lower yes. middle class, so right. it's not just <coughs> right. one classification. And so in my research, I point out, given if we think about class in income or occupational terms, that middle class African Americans are more likely to be lower middle class and whites are more likely to be upper middle class, either middle class or upper middle class. And when I say that, I mean both falling lower in the income distribution, but also more likely in those occupations that I mentioned, more likely to be in um, uh, office work uh, as administrators or office assistants as opposed to in the professional occupations. Now that's not to say they're not professional African Americans, of course, I myself am a professional African American, so that's not to say that there aren't professional blacks, but when I'm thinking, when you're talking about the distribution within this large category of middle class. Tell us a little bit about the history of the black middle class, and I, I really want you to go back to post-World War II mm -hmm. when we saw uh, kind of an explosion of uh, African Americans making yeah. uh, that, that step to the middle class. So pre-World War II, under Jim Crow segregation in the South and de facto segregation in the North and the, um, the fact that universities were off limits to African Americans, libraries were off limits to African Americans in the South, it was very difficult to grow a professional class um, or you know, jobs were closed to African Americans. So it was really post-World War II where we often think about the civil rights movement beginning in 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education, but a number of historians have often now talked about the early civil rights activism in the 1940s around fair employment practices, for example. Um, so when we think about that work in the 1940s around fair employment practices that were really the roots of what we now to call affirmative action, opening up workplaces and providing opportunities for a growth in the black middle class, a growth in the income earning potential for African Americans, and the beginnings of openings up, opening up of universities. That really came much later actually though, the 1960s were when universities began to open. Um, and both of those things, the uh, opening of the labor market, the opening of the universities, and the incredible growth in the, um, the, the country was growing at a rapid rate during that time anyway. There were lots so of the, opportunities lots for everybody. Lots of opportunities, exactly. So the post-World War II boom in the economy really allowed for a lot of opportunities. And then of course we have to talk about the changes in legislation, so the Civil Rights Act. Um, the, in housing and employment and so on. It's interesting because you're regarded as this generation's leading sociologist. In fact, your book, uh, Black on the, on the Block, is considered the de definitive analysis of, of race and class in, in the U.S. Um, but many say that you're really picking, taking up the mantle of W.E. Du Bois, of uh, Franklin Frazier, of William Julius Wilson, who was your mentor when mm -hmm. you were in school. And, and most of them would say, uh, that their scholarship was in service to social justice. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that makes sense to me. But yeah, uh, this is not false humility. I relish the compliment, but surely there are many, I, I, the definitive study of race and class, I, I would argue that there are, are many of us who exist in a body of definitive <laughs> studies of race and class, William Julius Wilson being one of them, um, American apartheid, uh, which is Doug Massey and Nancy Denton, really kind of setting the stage for the study of racial segregation and the importance of racial segregation. There are many more that I could, could cite, so I um, appreciate being in that crowd. Uh, and there's no question that I think, you know, I, I worked with, with William Julius Wilson and am um, definitely a student of his, but also consider myself at some distance a student of W.E.B. Du Bois. And I think Du Bois really set the model for all of us um, in later generations. So in, in, bo in both scholarship and activism. In fact, it's Du Bois who said that it's the, the black elite that is uh, morally and socially responsible for the disadvantaged. And I think William Julius uh, uh, Wilson uh, said that he's disappointed mm -hmm. that the, uh, I guess you would say the black middle class has not lived up to that. Mm -hmm. You, you, you disagree a little bit. I do disagree, and I think, um, I think again, Du Bois set the model in his own life for what he initially called the Talented Tenth and then kind of backed away from this notion of the Talented Tenth. But in his own life, he both was an incredible sociologist, really doing the, one of the first 
urban socio sociological works in the Philadelphia Negro in 1899, but also went on to help to be a co-founder of the uh, NAACP, uh, editing The Crisis, their magazine, and so on. Um, and Bill Wilson definitely follows in Du Bois's footsteps, in other um, prominent sociologists' footsteps, E. Franklin Frazier and what have you. And, and Wilson has, I think Wilson's critique in this respect, I think is actually more scholarly than it is activist. Wilson's critique, Wilson's observation is that middle class African Americans um, left poor black neighborhoods in the wake of the civil rights movement with the with opening up of fair housing after the civil rights act of the fair housing act of 1968 i don't think he's as critical of middle class blacks for doing that because i think he sees the um, what he sees mechanisms of mobility that all groups have followed but i even ha take issue and have a critique of the description that middle class blacks left poor black neighborhoods. In fact, you so say they're going back. They're going back mm -hmm. recently, but I also argue that they left, but they didn't get very far. So I think his research suggests when you read his discussion of out migration or the movement out of middle class blacks, there's not a lot of discussion about where they moved to. And when you look at the demography, when you look at the, again, the layout of the city, and, and this was my own experience with my family, um, not living in a poor black neighborhood, but living in neighborhoods that are adjacent to poor black neighborhoods. So they just didn't get very far. Uh, and so once you realize they didn't get very far, you have to ask, so what is the residential situation of middle class blacks and how does it differ a from middle what class is whites? It? And how does it differ? So it is much more proximate to areas of concentrated poverty, of areas of high poverty. It ha middle class blacks live in neighborhoods that have higher poverty rates, that have lower overall incomes, that have less well-funded schools and so on. So despite the fact that they are middle class in terms of income, exactly. they are experiencing crime that someone in lower class white situations might be experiencing? In fact, even more strongly than what you just said, all of, the, all of the information that we have shows that middle class blacks live in neighborhoods that on many measures are more disadvantaged than poor whites. So more disadvantaged than poor whites, not just more di disadvantaged than middle class whites, more disadvantaged than poor whites. And when I say that, I mean still living in high neighborhoods with higher poverty, with more crime, with uh, less political clout, less well-funded schools, less investment, public investment. Um, and that's, it's that comparison that is really stark. <laughs> it's, you might think, okay, we know there are racial disparities. You compare middle class blacks and whites and middle class blacks don't live in as good neighborhoods. But it's this disparity between middle class whites, blacks and poor whites that is particularly stark. And yet a lot of Americans look at the fact that President Barack Obama was elected president as proof positive that race doesn't matter anymore. Mm. And you say that's absolutely not the case. Uh, it's absolutely not the case. And I think uh, Obama's speech on race, as they call it, his speech on race after the incident with his pastor and his need, his um, decision to make a speech on race, illustrated that we are so not past race. I thought his speech was... Um, incredible in how sensitive it was both to racial attitudes, to racial attitudes on all sides. So he tried to um, to understand what might be some of the genesis, what might be the genesis of racial attitudes among whites, and what might be the genesis, in particular, of the attitudes that we had seen from his pastor Jeremiah Wright. So I think Obama himself would um, reject the idea that we are beyond race. Uh, and I think the fact that we're obsessed with the question if we're beyond race shows that we're not. And I you think personally it, know Barack Obama. He was your senator in Chicago. He was my and, and it's someone you know. state senator and now then my U.S. senator, someone who I had, um, who I, who went to Columbia as an undergrad as well. And so I knew him uh, in that way as, as both alumni of the same university. And he lives four blocks from me. His house, well, he lived four blocks from <laughs> me in Chicago. So I, I knew him personally. He's now president. I don't know how many people know the president personally. Um, but I, his early speeches, so for example, he would reference he would use Martin Luther King's words without saying, he, for example, in his acceptance of the um, at the Democratic National, at the, his acceptance of the nomination, he said, he called it King a preacher from Georgia. This was on the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, and he referred to King as a preacher from Georgia. Um, assuming that given all the news moving up to it, everybody knew who that preacher from Georgia was, but I, we live in a country where a lot of people can't put Iraq on a map, and so it's possible that there are some people who thought preacher from Georgia, hmm, Jimmy Carter, hmm, who might this preacher from Georgia be? So I thought it was important, for example, for Obama to say King's name. 
I had many debates with friends who would say, look, he doesn't have to throw race down everybody's throats, set down everybody's throat. He can subtly talk about race. And because again, race walks in when he walks in, people see that nonetheless. So I think there's, there's room for more discussion about that. <laughs> race walks in when he walks in. You've said, and, and, and others have said that we're obsessed with race mm -hmm. and, and yet it's not something we're, we're eager to talk about. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, President Obama uh, chose Eric Holder as his first black attorney general. Mm -hmm. And he has said uh, that we as a nation, we are a nation of cowards for avoiding candid conversations about race. Um, exactly, he said, uh, given all that we as a nation went through during the civil rights struggle, it is hard for me to accept that the result of those efforts was to create an America that is more prosperous, more positively race conscious, and yet is voluntary segregated. He went on to say that, that we're afraid to talk about it. So I wanna talk mm -hmm. about both of those things. Yeah. Are we afraid to talk about it and, and why? Um, I definitely think that we, I don't know if I'd use the word afraid, but we do avoid frank conversations of race. I think we talk about race all the time. So I, that's why I say I don't think we're afraid to talk about race. And surely when you compare the US to uh, other countries, uh, Latin America, Western Europe, we talk about race all the time. So they actually see us as being race obsessed rather than afraid to talk about race. I think what um, Attorney General Holder was getting at was the content of our racial discussions. So we're e we can tell if someone's black or white, we have no, or, or Latino, we have no problems talking on those levels. But I think to talk about inequalities, to talk about disadvantage, to talk about the um, continuation of racism despite having a black president, that we can't, I think, get our hands around that we could simultaneously have a black president and still have racism. I think we want, of course, not to, to be post-racist and post-race. Um, and I think it's difficult to, to believe, to accept that both are possible at the same time. So how do you get that conversation going? Uh, well, as a professor, I try to do it all the time in my classroom, and I try to do it by giving facts and figures. Um, facts and figures and narratives. I think some work better for some people, numbers versus words. Uh, there's some great work done by for a professor at Princeton, Diva Pager, where she sent out a white job, potential job applicant and a black potential job applicant. Same resume, the black and white potential job applicant, same resume. She thought she was gonna study the effects of having a criminal record on employment. She was particularly interested that if you checked a box that you had a criminal record, it, how likely or unlikely were you to get a call back? That's what she thought she was gonna study. But what she ultimately found out was that the same matched pairs, and she did a lot to make sure they were equal on all measures. I mean, it was all, it was an experiment, so these weren't real job applicants, these were college students. Right. She found that black, all men, black potential applicants who did not have a criminal record were less likely to get a call back than white potential applicants who had a criminal record. So that shows the importance of race despite criminal records. She thought she was studying one thing, she ended up studying really racial discrimination in the workforce. It's interesting because uh, if you look at something like affirmative action and you look at the situation at Mich Michigan uh, Law School some years back, um, there was this big debate about whether affirmative action should be abolished there mm -hmm. or not. Uh, a professor there by the name of uh, Richard Lempert uh, talked about the kinds of affirmative action that most people don't even acknowledge your grandfather is a graduate of mm -hmm. Michigan Law School mm -hmm. and your father is a graduate. And so there's a certain uh, affirmative action involved in that. You are going to be accepted before someone else who may have higher SAT scores. Right. Um, uh, and and from his, based on his research, there is there was a, a, a benefit to both the minority students and, and the majority mm -hmm. students in working together right. in law school because it allowed them to see a different perspective. Right. And I think, that's, that research is incredibly important to look at what are the criteria that, are, that go unnoticed that get people into school. And I think that's part of a larger discussion about cumulative disadvantage and cumulative advantage. So we look at, for example, wealth differences among blacks and whites, which are huge, much bigger than income differences. And part of that story was 
um, part of the foundation for that story was set in the post-World War II period, which was both a moment of prosperity, but also a moment where we enacted policies that systematically disadvantaged blacks and kept African Americans from home ownership, especially in suburbs. And I won't get into that long line of policies, but as a result, it created less, most Americans own most of their wealth in houses, in their ho homes. Um, and the fact that blacks were redlined out of suburbs and that um, federal policies often supported these discriminatory policies uh, led to this disparity of wealth that we see now. So I think what, what our um, difficulty with talking frankly about race is that we fear that it will boil down to somebody pointing a finger at some individual and saying, you are a racist. And that's hurtful, unproductive, doesn't, shuts everything down. But I think where we can perhaps open up the conversation is to not to point fingers at individuals, but to see how we live in a society that has created large disadvantages and disparities rather than you know, bad individuals. Um, that's not to say that there aren't individual, individual acts of racism, uh, but as sociologists, I think we're just as in, interested in the more large-scale societal kinds of processes. You, you mentioned just a moment ago accumulated wealth and, and home ownership, and I'm wondering what does this mean for the black middle class, for example, when we're in a recession mm -hmm. or when we're experiencing the kind of economic downturn that we're experiencing right now? And it's especially acute when you look at the numbers that show that middle class blacks were disproportionately likely to be in these subprime loans, for example even when you control for, meaning you compare an African-American and a white person with same income, same credit score, same um, assets and so on, blacks were still disproportionately steered into subprime loans. So now given that those are the ones that are ballooning and having larger payments and the interest rates are going up, um, we see that the foreclosure crisis, for example, is particularly acute in already fragile black neighborhoods. So uh, it's, I think, I don't think it's gotten enough attention actually in the media. I think we focus a lot on the newer, uh, the brand new developments where houses are not being sold, but it's in longstanding fragile black communities where there are particular, there's particular devastation. If we look at the white community, you see from one generation to the next that, that the status that my parents reached is, gives me an advantage mm -hmm. and, and, and most generations have actually, in terms of income, uh, have exceed mm -hmm. uh, where, their, where their parents ended up. I I'm wondering what does it take for a, an African American child today to reach the middle class and how difficult is it to stay there? Mm -hmm. Um, so, of course, some African American kids are born into the middle class, so they begin in the middle class. And with some of that privilege. With some of that privilege, for sure, and born into the upper class as well. I mean, I don't want to understate the actual real growth in the top high earning end of the black uh, income distribution. So there's been a real growth in that high, um, that high, earn, high income end in the black uh, community. So first the fact that there are already there are middle class black kids and upper class black kids who are born into privilege and thus their challenge is to hold on to that privilege because we actually know there has some, been some really interesting research recently done by the Brookings Institution and the Pew Charitable Trust about downward mobility so we know downward mobility is much more common among African Americans than it is among um, whites but I think your question was more about upward mobility so assuming a, a young person is not beginning in the middle class what does it take to be upwardly mobile? A and to uh, go beyond their parents' to achievements. To go beyond their parents, right. Um, and that's where, again, I think it's important to really look at uh, society and structure. And I, and I think Obama's talking about these things, but the real need to invest in education. Um, we, we have a lot of discussion about early childhood education. We have, have a lot of research about uh, among poor families here, no matter the race, among poor families, the, number, the fact that um, poor families Children in poor families begin with a f with fewer words when they by the time they start kindergarten than uh, families from uh, kids from middle class or upper income families. So the exposure to just one the 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 size of the vocabulary for kids coming in kind of already starting with a disadvantage. So early childhood education is really key to begin to um, eliminate some of those disparities. Um, I think. Uh, 
Investing in housing is really important because we see a lot of housing instability. Um, I was just looking over some information today. We know that about 15% of, 10 to 15% of Americans don't have health insurance, but about 35% of Americans have some kind of housing problem, either living in overcrowded conditions, substandard condi conditions, or housing cost burden, paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. So looking at housing stability and um, the ability for families not to spend so much money on rent. So I think there are lots of places to intervene to start to increase the possibility for upward mobility for not just black children, but disadvantaged children more generally. But in so doing, I think you'll, there'll be particular impact for black children. I think there's this perception that there's a larger uh, poor black population than there actually is. Um, well, the one misperception is that there are more poor black people than there are poor white people, and that's not true, just because the white population is much larger, even though the percentage of whites who are poor is smaller, the actual raw numbers of poor people, there are more poor white people than there are poor black people, so that's true. Um, but I think what people are queuing in on is that the poverty rate among African Americans is much higher. It's about three times that of whites, so about 25 percent, um, 25 to 30 percent, depending on the year and what, how you're defining it, uh, of African Americans have incomes below the poverty line. That compares to about 10, or 8 to 11 percent, depending on how you define it, for whites. So poverty is more prevalent among African Americans. It's just not true that the majority of poor people in this country are poor. Or that the majority of blacks are poor. I mean, the more the poor people in this country are black. Um, or that the majority, majority of blacks, blacks are poor. poor. And really, that, that's, and yeah. that's what I was oh, getting at. That's what, that's what at. I was yes, really getting right. at. In an essay uh, for, for Frontline, um, the two nations of black America, Harvard professor uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. asked the question, are we better off? And one of the things, though, he said that was disturbing to him is that uh, in the 1990s, we saw we have both the largest um, black middle class and all the, also the largest black underclass. Mm -hmm. Right, and and I think it's to tell. I wonder if we social scientists, we scholars, might not contribute to the misconception that there is a larger black poor population than that. That all African Americans are poor, basically. Um, I think perhaps some of the focus, even in our own work, leads to that, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to study the middle class to to move us away from that um, misperception about the black community. Uh, I think Gates's research or Gates's documentary. He actually did a whole piece on this. Um, overstated the fractures within the black community. The title was Two Nations of Black America. My own research suggests there aren't two nations. In fact, there's a lot of both fluidity across class. This is the mobility story that I mentioned, both upward mobility and downward mobility, so that two nations suggest a lack of movement across class categories. But there's also a lot of uh, connection, family connection, friendship connection, institutional connections through churches, through employment, those kinds of things. My own research shows, for example, that uh, middle-class blacks are three times as likely to have a poor sibling as middle-class whites are. So this, I call this poverty in the family. So just because I'm not poor doesn't mean I don't have any um, exposure to poor people, you know, my own sibling, or there's also, middle-class blacks are much more likely to have grown up poor themselves, so that upward mobility story. Well, let's talk about your research and your community because you were an observer and a participant in, in some things going on in North Kenwood, Oakland mm -hmm. in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us what, uh, what prompted you to move to that neighborhood, what you found when you got there, and how it's changed. So as you mentioned, I've been studying the black middle class. My first book was on a lower middle class black neighborhood, and I focused on the socialization of young people, in particular how youth grow up in a neighborhood um, that, has, that, that is more class diverse than most white youth grow up in. Um, and so I was really interested in interclass interactions. And here was a neighborhood, North Kenwood, Oakland, that was even more dynamic than the first neighborhood I'd studied because the poles were even, in, in some respects, I, I still don't use the word two nations, but it was gentrifying in a way that has been a very poor neighborhood and now black professionals were moving in. So the distance between the newcomers and the people who lived there was even greater than the distance in the first neighborhood I studied. So I thought this would be a particularly dynamic place to understand and class within the black community. Did you? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, 
So I moved to this neighborhood wanting to understand how, given these class differences, was there any hope for a notion of community? Would there be dialogue? What would be the grounds for building connections or not? Um, and indeed, there was a lot of dialogue. And I ended up arguing, what was, became very clear is that what defines the black community is not any set of politics, any political persuasion, any particular kind of ideology, or any even set of values. What defines the black community is a commitment to engaging in debates about those things. So engaging in debates about values and ideologies and politics and behavior and norms and all of these things. Um, engaging in that debate is what is the black community. It's the debate. It's the project towards getting so to So are you saying some... that, that, that this debate that you're sort of describing mm -hmm. took place between the professionals like yourself sure. and, and the residents who lived there long before you moved in who Definitely. are uh, maybe fixing their car in the front, uh, on the front sidewalk mm -hmm. and that's uh, perhaps something that a uh, middle class uh, member isn't too fond of seeing? Those and, are exactly the kinds of debates. So they were often behavioral. They were often how, what's appropriate behavior in a neighborhood? Uh, is fixing your car right on the street, is that appropriate behavior? Um, and when we had, when those debates occurred, one always had to keep in mind that for, so for someone who, this gets back to the point I was making earlier, for someone who might have just come out of jail, having a hard time getting a job, this was a way to make money. And it was a way actually that provide a service for many people on the block, the fixing the cars right, right there on the street. Now, for those of us who had nine to five jobs, we had no need for getting our cars fixed on the street and we did, we, it didn't really bother me that much, right. but for some <laughs> other people, didn't want to see it right there on the street. This was not a place for an auto repair shop. Uh, but there were debates about that and there was a back and forth. There was a challenging of the initial reaction like, okay, this is not a place to fix cars. And then there were people who would come back and say, but people need to make a living. and. So these kinds of debates about anything from fixing cars to, um, uh, I have other stories about barbecuing, exactly, about standing in front of your building, about where children should play, about how loud children should be. Any number of things in this neighborhood became discussions, but also discussions about more, I would say more political issues about housing policy, for example. So um, in, with public housing in this neighborhood, what should be the rules for public housing, those kinds of things. Well, well you mentioned the term gentrification. And, and before I ask you about the differences between black gentrification and white gentrification, define for me what you mean mm -hmm. by that. So uh, gentrification is basically um, the movement in to a working class or poor neighborhood of people who are middle or upper income, the gentry. It's real, the word really comes from that term, the gentry. Um, gentrification can take, you know, on the ground, looks very different. Sometimes there might be um, the neighborhood that people are, that, that is being gentrified might actually not have many residents at all. It might be mostly an old industrial place where there are small shops or that kind of thing. That might be gentrification. But this neighborhood that I studied was very residential, not at all industrial. And so there, there were people living there already and new people moving in. Just so happened that in this neighborhood, there was also a lot of vacant land, which is not uncommon in, in disinvested neighborhoods. And, and so home prices are, are reasonable and people can move in. And so I'm wondering, uh, do whites move into neighborhoods uh, and, and create this gentrification right. that you're talking about for different reasons than, than blacks? Uh, I think yes and no. So both blacks and whites are motivated by, as you mentioned, reasonable housing prices. Oftentimes also gentrifying neighborhoods, it's the old real estate location, location, location. So the one I studied in particular, it's along the lakefront, very 10 minutes from downtown near the University of Chicago. Uh, location is not an objective fact. Those, it's always been 10 minutes from downtown right on the lakefront near the University of Chicago, but it's only since downtown Chicago has started to uh, get bigger into the South Loop, for example, and the University of Chicago has uh, increased its breadth, um, that that location started to, to be even more attractive. Um, so surely the people moving into this neighborhood are attracted for the same reasons that whites who move into, gen who gentrify other often city neighborhoods are attracted. So they're good amenities, um, especially locational amenities. But in addition to that, for black gentrifiers, there surely is a discussion also about 
uh, reclaiming a neighborhood that had really fallen on hard times. So the neighborhood, North Kenwood, Oakland, was one of the poorest community areas in the entire city of Chicago. Um, a lot of disinvestment, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, vacant land where places, buildings who, that had been demolished and nothing had been built, uh, uh, very high rates of crime and so on. And there, it, 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 the neighborhood had a real storied history. So. Um, uh, Muddy Waters, a great blues musician, lived in North Kenwood, Oakland. Um, Thomas Dorsey, who's often called the father of gospel music, lived in Oakland. And we're talking about old, gorgeous stone old, houses from the, from the houses, 1890s, definitely. which is, I think, describes yours. Yes, and it, it, the neighborhood, um, after the activism of a number of the uh, residents, achieved landmark status in the city of Chicago. So it, a lot of charm, a lot of attraction, but I think especially its identity as a rich, hist historically rich black neighborhood attracted middle and upper income black folk who wanted to contribute to the renaissance of a black community. Okay, so it brings resources to uh, a segment of the population that, that was underserved in, in terms mm -hmm. of banking and, and shopping Definitely. and all kinds of things, but there were unintended consequences. Definitely unintended consequences. So those are all positive things and many of the, the existing residents were very pleased to see banks coming in, to see a new grocery store come in, to see um, the vacant lots, which were nothing more than places where people put trash and where rodents lived and so on, those vacant lots now being built up and um, becoming attractive new housing. So those were all pluses. Uh, but they're not only pluses, and they're especially those changes, I would say many of the existing residents saw them as somewhat ominous signs of were they going to be able to stay? Was this going to be a place for them to live as well? And the kind of surveillance that came on the heels of this new uh, development. So the kinds of um, what had been okay to do, sitting on the porch and fixing the cars and barbecuing and um, having parties at night and hanging out in the park, the kinds of things that had been appropriate and and people had participated Accepted. in now now became uh, affronts to the quality of the life of the new folks who were moving in who would complain oh I have to get up and go to work in the morning people shouldn't be out there at 10 o'clock or oh I don't want to see I don't want there to be oil spots on the street after someone has changed done an oil job in front of my house so, not, to, not to mention that some people literally now can't afford to live here because property values have increased yeah, definitely so for that's especially um, true for renters uh, and the neighborhood very few homeowners when the neighborhood first began its transition. So for homeowners, about, it's a good thing. For the, the few homeowners, but the neighborhood only up. had about a 10% home ownership rate. So there were very few people who were able to, to capitalize off of this change. For renters, where the absentee owner could easily, you know, kick them out and sell the building at a, at a nice profit, it was there in their interest to do so, not in the interest of renters. Um, I have to say, though, in the social science literature, this question about displacement and gentrification is a tricky one because there's been some data that, sh that has shown that the displacement pressures aren't as strong as it look that they as they look to be on the ground. It's it's in some respects a kind of statistical mystery anomaly. Yeah, because part of it, the reason, part of the explanation is um, that that poor families who live in these neighborhoods want to hold on. They see the neighborhood improving, and so they actually stay longer than uh, equivalent poor families in neighborhoods that aren't improving because they have an incentive to do so. So they actually stay longer, uh, but when they do move, they're replaced by uh, a non-poor family. So it's more replacement than displacement. So you're saying not as many people as we might imagine are pushed out of these neighborhoods. Exactly, right. You say part of what is needed, and, and, I, and I think you worked on uh, uh, inclusionary zoning, mm -hmm. um, was more tolerance. Did that kind of thing happen? And is it more likely to happen in a neighborhood where you're seeing black gentrification right. versus white? So uh, there's no answer to that question because every, neighborhoods are always Different. always oh. changing. So there's no answer. Did tolerance happen? The question really more is, is tolerance happening? <laughs> and so I would argue, I still live in North Kenwood, Oakland. I still go to community meetings. These are still front and center issues. We continue to talk about the parks. We continue to talk about the new public housing that will be built and the new market rate housing that, we, that will be built. We continue to talk about safety and security. All of these things are continuing to be negotiated. It's still part of that debate that I was talking about. So I think though that there are, um, there is greater attention to this need for tolerance. Um, and 
there surely are efforts to, you know, through community activities, through, there's a photographic exhibit in the neighborhood that I live that tries to both um, document the old and, and talk about the new and to get people talking about the neighborhood being uh, changing. So I think there are always efforts to grow this tolerance and I think it's always, as I mentioned, it's always a project. Talk a little bit, if you would, about even among black uh, middle class uh, neighborhoods, and, and this is the same can be true among white middle class neighborhoods, there's an attraction to gangsta. And so a certain, mm -hmm. a certain dress, despite the fact uh, that mom and dad are both professionals, uh, that's not what right. you present when, when you're outside. So why is it done and how is it viewed? So first of all, let me just say I really appreciate your making the comparison between black and white, both neighborhoods and middle class families, because I often, when I talk, people say, well, that's just uh, white students or whatever, will say, that's just how it is in my neighborhood, so I don't think this is just a black thing. And I agree, much of what I talk about is not just a black thing. Um, some of the things that I talk about are much more prevalent in black communities, but that doesn't mean they're absent from white communities. And the example that you raise, I think, is a perfect one. So the infatuation with rap music, for example, and and hip hop culture more generally through videos, through DJing, through um, graffiti, any number of things. These are not things that are exclusive to the black community. In fact, many of, much, of the, much of the data on music buying shows that, what, that white youth are actually the bigger buyers of rap music than our black youth. Uh, so, so hip hop culture is American culture in, in every sense of the word. Um, but what I argue is the particular kinds of risks of of, of taking on a certain persona. So I, in, in many cities across the country, especially in, for example, shopping malls where black youth, that black youth frequent, there are now dress codes against baggy pants or hats. Surely hats turn to any one particular side. Uh, so again, the kind of surveillance that black youth experience that is not, um, that is not as prevalent in white communities. It's not that it's absent, but it's just not as prevalent in white communities. The kind of risk that black youth run by um, their youthful forays into any number of things, into just dress, but also into, there's a great book by a sociologist named Jack Katz uh, on the seductions of crime. That's the title of the book. And he has this whole chapter where he had his students at UCLA write about their participation in crime. And, and he has this chapter called Sneaky Thrills. It's not that white youth aren't stealing things. <laughs> it's that the risks that they might be really put in jail are actually lower than they are for black youth. So it's these kinds of things that I really want to point up the risks of black youths partip participating in things that that you that are really parts of youth culture but that have different kinds of repercussions for black youth and for white youth one of the things that I uh, found very interesting in, in reading uh, what you have to say about there being no singular identity is that while there is no singular identity um, you seem to say that there is uh, uh, this idea of a linked fate mm -hmm. that it's important that if I do well that that others among my race also do well. Right, and I do think that's one of the cores of this notion of the black community. As I mentioned, the black community is not um, monolithic in its ideologies and its values and its politics, but we do see over two thirds of African Americans feeling like their future is linked to that of other African Americans. And in fact, the number goes up among more highly educated blacks. So more highly educated blacks are more likely to think that their fate is connected to other African Americans. So these cross-class connections are really key. Well, it's interesting that you say that because if you go back to the affirmative action debate at the Michigan Law School, the black graduates performed more pro bono work mm, than the exactly. white graduates. Right, yeah. That was, there were so many interesting findings from as the people tried to put together a bunch of research that showed affirmative, the importance of affirmative action. And one of the things was this, um, the benefit of educating, of, of um, having African Americans in law schools and in undergrads is that you then create a cadre of folks on the other end who are giving back in certain kinds of ways to the communities. Which, which is really what Du yeah. Bois was, was right. advocating yeah. uh, back in what, 1903, exactly. talking about the, the top 10th right. um, and, that's and the role that they play. In fact, one of the most interesting findings. So you ask black folk, uh, middle class black folk, do you think you have a responsibility 
to give back to poor African Americans? And by and large, they say yes. But when you ask poor blacks, do you think the middle class has a responsibility to give back to poor blacks? They're less likely to think that middle class folks should have this responsibility. So there's a kind of guilt among middle and upper income black folk. They feel more responsible even than poor people think they should feel for them. So there, it's, it's an inch, the survey data is really interesting on this front. Uh, and then we have uh, Harvard University professor uh, Cornell West who reminds us that despite money, despite education, despite prestige, he still may be on a street corner waiting for a cab mm -hmm. and passed. Mm -hmm. a and I'm wondering if you could talk a little about what the impact on, on mental health and physical health is of this persistent uh, racism that I've sort of just described. My own research hasn't really studied those kinds of uh, effects, although I definitely read that literature. Most recently, kind of top of mind for me right now is a, an anthropologist who's been studying, um, actually been studying Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico, of course, is a diverse, um, very diverse place with people across the skin tone spectrum. And uh, he's been looking at the relationship between skin color and hypertension. And hypertension, of course, is one of these uh, physical reactions that we might expect could be the result of discrimination. Um, right now, we're in this craze in the, in, in the um, scientific world about um, being able to look at genetic causes of hypertension. And so many people are arguing that uh, there is some genetic link between um, having African ancestry and, and being hypertensive. But he actually argues that what they're missing is the social reality of people who are of African descent. And so it's not that people who are darker skinned have more African ancestry and thus have a greater genetic pre, um, are more um, predisposed. predisposed, right, to, to having hypertension. It's that darker skin color uh, creates situations that they experience more racial discrimination and then that creates more hypertension. So I think we've rushed to the genetic level before really, really interrogating the social level where people are reading people's skin tones. Now you said just a moment ago that you've, you've read about, these ex uh, about this discrimination. Have you experienced it? Um, of course I've experienced, I would say, I would say I have experienced uh, what I would call inappropriate racial remarks. I wouldn't say that, and in here I think it's important to talk about um, interpersonal racism versus structural racism. So I'm taking your question to mean interpersonal racism. So I have had people say things to me that I thought were insensitive, that I thought um, illustrated racial insensitivity. I've had someone tell me I was hired because of affirmative action, which, you know, is not, ra I was hired. So nonetheless, you know, I didn't experience discrimination because I was African American. Um, but that comment, I think, suggested that that person didn't think I was fully qualified for the job and I got the job just, just because I was black. Uh, so that's on an interpersonal front. And I think it's really important also to think about the demographic character, my own demographic characteristics. So I'm a woman, and I, not that black women don't experience dis, uh, discrimination, because they most definitely do, um, but I do think that there are gender differences in discrimination, and I'm very light-skinned. Uh, so skin tone stratification, we have a, a, a fair amount of literature in social sociology on um, differences in income between light-skinned African-Americans and dark-skinned African-Americans. So we know that light-skinned African-Americans actually have higher educational attainment and higher incomes than do, than do darker-skinned blacks. And I think that's really important to you know, factor in when thinking about my own personal experiences. Um, but that doesn't mean that in a structural way I haven't been, I don't live in a system, as we all do, live in a system where um, my family has been disadvantaged as a result. So. Um, we lived in Milwaukee. My father is very, very fair skinned and my mother is a brown skinned black woman. My father went to go get an apartment near where he was working, which was in a predominantly white part of town. And they were gonna rent the apartment to him. And then my mother showed up with the kids. I wasn't born yet, but with the four kids and up oh, the apartment wasn't available anymore. Uh, and it was in response to that um, that we then lived the rest of our lives pretty much in predominantly black communities, which was wonderful for many reasons, but also has its disadvantages. So all of the things that I went on to study about the ways in which middle class uh, African Americans live in neighborhoods with higher poverty rates and schools that are less funded, it's one of the reasons why I was bused to an, a suburban school because the central city schools in Milwaukee weren't as strong as the suburban schools. Um, so the way in which, you know, 
we lived in a we live in a world where residential discrimination uh, shapes the kinds of neighborhoods that people live in and grow up in. Uh, definitely affected my family as well. I want to go back to what Eric Holder said about voluntary segregation. What, what do you make of, of that? Because it sounds given like, story, given, given your story, it doesn't sound like that was voluntary exactly. segregation. And one could very well have looked, surely later on, that happened in the late 1960s when uh, that, that first incident, and then we, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, and one could very well say, say by the 1980s, that my family chose to live in that neighborhood. Here my parents were professionals, we could have lived, you know, people would then say anywhere we wanted to live, and, um, and we chose to live in that neighborhood. But then, just to follow through on this, uh, my mother actually was a party to a race discrimination suit in the early 1990s, where a very similar thing happened. She, um, she was actually part of a kind of tester group where she went to go rent an apartment, or she called about the apartment it was available. She showed up, the apartment wasn't available anymore uh, in another part of Milwaukee that was um, at that time predominantly white. So this was the early 1990s. Uh, and we have, there's a lot of research, the Urban Institute has done some research on this that shows that there, there still is racial discrimination in housing. It's not as strong as it had been in the past, and the kinds of techniques, the racial steering and so on, are not nearly as strong. But we continue to have to fight fair housing battles as well. If you would talk about the, the structural uh, uh, racism that you're talking about, what would it take? What kind of a, a comprehensive uh, agenda would mm. be required to eliminate it? If I had that agenda, I would be in Obama's cabinet right now. If I had that agenda to eliminate uh, racial discrimination, especially in housing. Um, so I think on the enfor enforcement side, we, I think one of the problems is that we rely on individuals like my mom to be able to recognize that she was the victim of racial discrimination. And that's not easily apparent. Uh, you go, they tell you the apartment has been rented. How are you, How you supposed prove, to know right? that, you know, what's going on here? So most race discrimination, both in housing and in employment, and, and sex discrimination as well, depends on the victim to prove the, it has the burden the of burden. proof on the victim. Um, and and, and the, the, the bar is quite high. I mean, we've had a number of sex, discrim sex discrimination cases where the, the victims have not prevailed because you really have to prove systematic uh, discrimination. And of course, the, especially at the corporate level, the, the funding on their ability to mount a defense case is quite, uh, they have quite Deep a lot pockets. of resources to do that. So, um, so I think we need to think about what are the criteria necessary to to show racial discrimination for the kinds of enforcement mechanisms that we have. And if we need more testing, more federal testing, for example, to expose racial discrimination and then uh, think about remedies once it's exposed. But I also think, uh, I, I, part of it has, it takes time. Part of it is a part of the process of Obama being elected president. Part of it is changing hearts and minds because what we see in a lot of the social science research is, for example, we have, have experiments where you give people hypothetical neighborhoods where you tell them, for example, you vary things like that the crime is high or low, the property values are going up or down, the schools are good or bad, those things you vary. And then you also vary the proportion of African Americans or Latinos or Asians in the neighborhood. And what we find in those, experimental, in those experiments is that even when you say that the, crime is, is, there's, that the crime is low, the schools are good, the property values are going up, but then you start to increase the proportion black in the neighborhood, there still is resistance on the part of whites to moving in that na those neighborhoods when the hypothetical outgroup are African Americans. It's not for, true for Latinos and, white, uh, Latinos and Asians, but it is true for African Americans. So I think there really, it's just a lot of work we have to do about changing hearts and minds. Um, around racial antipathies. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And I think having a black president will, will go a long way towards doing that, but not all the way <laughs> by any stretch. Well, I, I want to end with, with this. You say that aggressive measures are needed to improve the socioeconomic uh, situation of African Americans mm -hmm. where they are. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering, what's at stake for African Americans 
and for whites. Yeah. So on the so that aggressive measure. So here I'm talking about place-based interventions, and here I am talking about really large infusions of money for schools, for infrastructure, for um, improving uh, access to living wage jobs, not just jobs, we emphasize jobs, but jobs aren't helpful if people still can't afford to live, to support housing, afford food, and what have you. These are aggressive measures. They sound, you know, Obama says them, everybody says them, and they sound like we kind of all know what to do, but they require a big, decision on the part of the Big American commitment. people about where we're going to put our resources and where we're going to pull resources from in order to do that. But I think it's um, it's just as important for black communities as it is for white communities in the following way. I think we uh, depress our productivity as a nation by continuing to foster racial discrimination, to c continuing to let racism languish, continuing to let central cities um, die if they're going to and the residents within them to die. We surely, the cost in human life, uh, especially among African Americans, um, is dire with, um, with gun violence, for example. And we now know, I mean, this is, so here's another aggressive measure around gun violence. Why do we have so many guns on the street? And this is not just, a, of course, anything for African Americans. I'm glad I'm not the president. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not even mayor because these are hard decisions to make. It's somewhat easy for me to sit in this chair and kind of see what we could do, but they're aggressive. Mary Patillo, thanks for joining the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Mary Patillo, professor of sociology and African-American studies at Northwestern University. You'll find many more resources about the black middle class on our website, conversations.psu.edu. You'll also find a slideshow of photos taken by Mary Patillo of the Chicago neighborhoods featured in her books. We look forward to seeing you for our next Conversations from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800 770 2111.